Wait Till Helen Comes, A Ghost Story by Mary Downing Hand. Chapter 1 You've bought a church? Michael and I looked up from the pile of homework covering most of the kitchen table. I was in the middle of writing a poem for Mr. Pulowski's English class, and Michael was working his way happily through twenty math questions. Mom filled a kettle with water and put it on the stove. Her cheeks were pink from the March wind, and so was the tip of her nose. You and Molly will love it, she promised. It's exactly the sort of place Dave and I have been looking for all winter. There's a carriage house for him to use as a pottery workshop, and a space in the choir loft for me to set up a studio. It's perfect. But how can we live in a church? Michael persisted, refusing to be won over by her enthusiasm. Oh, it's not really a church anymore, Mom said. Some people from Philadelphia bought it last year and built an addition on the side for living quarters. They were going to set up an antique store in the actual church, but after doing all that work, they decided they didn't like living in the country after all. It's out in the country? I frowned at the little cat I was doodling in the margin of my notebook paper. Mom smiled and gazed past me, out our kitchen window and into Mrs. Overton's window, directly across the alley. I had a feeling she was seeing herself standing in front of an easel, working on one of her huge oil paintings, far from what she called the soul-killing life of the city. She had a maddening habit of drifting away into her private dream world, just when you need her most. Where is the church? I asked loudly. Where is it? Mom poured boiling water into her cup and added honey. It's in Hallwell, Maryland, not far from the mountains. It's beautiful, just beautiful. The perfect place for painting and potting. But what about Molly and me? What are we supposed to do while you and Dave paint and make pottery? Michael asked. You promised I could be in the enrichment program this summer. I said, thinking about the creative writing class I was planning to take. Will I still be able to? Yes, and what about science club? Michael asked. I'm already signed up for it. Mr. Phillips is going to take us to the aquarium and the science center and even to the Smithsonian in Washington. Mom sighed and shook her head. I'm afraid you two will have to make other plans for summer. We'll be moving in June and I can't possibly drive all the way back to Baltimore every day. But I've been looking forward to Science Club all year! Michael's voice rose, and I could tell he was trying hard not to cry. You'll have plenty of woods to explore, Mom said calmly. Just think of all the wildlife you can observe, and the insects you can add to your collection. Why, the day Dave and I were there, we saw a raccoon, a possum, a woodchuck, and dozens of squirrels. Mom leaned across the table, smiling, hoping to convince Michael that he was going to love living in a church way out in the country, miles away from Mr. Phillips and Science Club. But Michael wasn't easy to convince. Slumping down in his chair, he mumbled, I'd rather stay in Baltimore, even if I never see anything but cockroaches, pigeons, and rats. Oh, for heaven's sake, Michael, Mom looked exasperated. You're ten years old. Act like it. As Michael opened his mouth to defend himself, Heather appeared in the kitchen doorway, responding, no doubt, to her built-in radar for detecting trouble. Her pale gray eyes roved from Mom to Michael, then to me, and back to Mom. From the expression on her face, I imagined she was hoping to witness bloodshed, screams, and ghastly scenes of domestic violence. Why, Heather, I was wondering where you were. Mom turned to her, infusing her voice with enthusiasm again. Guess what? Your daddy and I have found a new place for us to live, way out in the country. Won't that be fun? She gave Heather a dazzling romper room smile and reached out to embrace her. With the skill of a cat, Heather sidestepped Mom's arms and peered out the kitchen window. Daddy's home, she announced without looking at us. Oh no, I forgot to put the casserole in the oven. Mom ran to the refrigerator and pulled out a concoction of eggplant, cheese, tomatoes, and bulger and shoved it into the oven just as Dave opened the back door, bringing a blast of cold March air into the room with him. After giving Mom a hug and a kiss, he swooped Heather up into his arms. How's my girl? 
he boomed. Heather twined her arms possessively around his neck and smiled coyly. They were fighting, she said, darting a look at Michael and me. Dave glanced at Mom, and she smiled and shook her head. We were just discussing our big move to the country. That's all. Nobody was fighting, Heather. Mom turned on the cold water and began rinsing lettuce leaves for a salad. I don't like it when they fight. Heather tightened her grip on Dave's neck. Come on, Michael. I stood up and started gathering my books and papers together. Let's finish our homework downstairs. Dinner will be ready in about half an hour, Mom called after us as we started down the basement steps. As soon as we were safely out of everybody's hearing range, I turned to Michael. What are we going to do? He flopped down on the old couch in front of the television. Nothing. It's too late, Molly. They've bought the church, and we're moving there. Period. Grabbing a pillow, he tossed it across the room, narrowly missing one of Mom's paintings, a huge close-up of a sunflower. Why did she have to marry him? We were perfectly happy before he and Heather came along. I slumped beside him, nodding my head in agreement. They've ruined everything. Glancing at the stairs to make sure Heather hadn't sneaked down to spy on us, I said, If only Heather was a normal kid. She acts more like a two-year-old than a seven-year-old. And she's mean. She tattles and lies and does everything she can to get us in trouble with Dave. Why do they always take her side? Even Mom. Michael made a face. You know what Dave says. Making his voice deep and serious, he said, Heather is an unusually imaginative and sensitive child, and she has suffered a great loss. You and Molly must be patient with her. I groaned. How long can we feel sorry for her and be nice to her? I know it must have been horrible to see her mother die in a fire and be too little to help, but she was only three years old. She should have gotten over it by now, Michael. He nodded. If Dave would take her to a shrink, I bet she would get better. My friend Martin's little brother goes to some guy out in Townsend, and it's helped him a lot. He plays with dolls and draws pictures and makes things out of clay. I sighed. You know perfectly well what Dave thinks of shrinks, Michael. I heard him tell Mom that all they do is mess up your head. Michael got up and flipped the TV to Speed Racer. With one eye on the screen, he set about doing the rest of his math while I sat there doodling more cats instead of finishing my poem. After a few minutes, I nudged Michael. Do you remember that movie we saw on TV about the little girl who did horrible things to her enemies? The Bad Seed? Yes, that was it. Well, sometimes I think Heller's like that girl, Rhoda. Suppose she burned her mother up on purpose, the way Rhoda burned up the janitor. Michael peered at me over the top of his glasses. You're crazy, Molly. No three-year-old kid could do anything like that. He was speaking to me as if he were a scientist explaining something to a child, instead of a ten-year-old boy addressing his twelve-year-old sister. Realizing how ridiculous I sounded, I laughed and said, <laughs> Just kidding. But I really wasn't. There was something about Heather that made me truly uncomfortable. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't even like her, let alone love her as Mom kept urging me to. It was hard to feel pity or anything but dislike for her. It wasn't as if I hadn't tried. When Heather had first moved in, I'd done everything I could think of to be a good big sister. But she'd made it clear that she wanted nothing to do with me. If I tried to comb her hair, she pulled away, crying to Mom that I was hurting her. If I offered to read to her, she'd yawn after the first sentence or two and say the story was boring and dumb. Once I made the mistake of letting her play with my old Barbie dolls, the ones I was saving for my children, she cut their hair off playing beauty parlor and ripped their best outfits. She even tore up a family of paper dolls I made for her, taking great pleasure in beheading them right in front of me. Then she dropped them disdainfully in the trash can and walked out of the room. To make it even worse, she told lies about Michael and me making it sound as if we tormented her whenever we were alone with her. Dave believed her most of the time, and sometimes Mom did too. In the six months that Mom and Dave had been married, things had gotten very tense in our home, and as far as I could see, Heather was responsible for most of the bad feelings. 
and now we were moving to a little church in the country where there would be no escape from her all summer. Was it any wonder that I was depressed? I glanced at Michael, still hard at work on his map. My own poem was now almost obscured by the cats I'd drawn all over the notebook paper. I stared at it sadly, no longer in the mood to continue writing about unicorns, rainbows, and castles in the clouds. Tearing it out of my notebook, I crumpled it into a ball and tossed it at Speed Racer. As he zipped past in his little car, then I began writing a poem about real life. Something depressing, dealing with loneliness and unhappiness and the misery of being misunderstood and unloved. This was my favorite scary storybook when I was a little girl. I hope you stick around and get into it with me. They also made a movie about it, which is equally as spooky.